a solitary intercontinental long-range rocket, otherwise called an ICBM, is being sent off toward the US to carry on an atomic assault. Obviously in the event that this was an out-and-out -out atomic conflict, many ICBMs and submarines sent off long-range rockets would be sent off, in which case, it's precisely exact thing you think, dead, game over. You basically can't stop a strike of many ICBMs, each conveying several atomic warheads. In any case, the stuff to try and catch a solitary ICBM isn't your thought process. It can require as long as 30 seconds to recognize the send-off of an ICBM, contingent upon the climate. In the event that it's overcast, when the rocket transcends mists, the rocket's exhaust would be identified by infrared sensors, either on the more seasoned guard backing system satellites or on the other hand more up-to-date space-based infrared framework. When an ICBM is recognized by different satellites, an exact direction of the supporter can be determined, yet not really its objective. Subsequently a choice must be made by order and control. Is the rocket threatening, or might it at some point be only an activity? Actually a basic test send-off could be considered to be provocative and begin an atomic war. Hence, the US has as of late dropped a Minuteman 3 ICBM test on the grounds that have expanded pressure with Russia because of their intrusion of Ukraine. However, when the choice is made to fire an interceptor, there would be various chances to shoot down the ICBM, since long-range rockets go through three periods of flight, help stage, mid-course stage, and terminal stage. Seemingly, the least demanding opportunity to kill an ICBM is during its lift stage, however incidentally, the most unviable one, catching an ICBM during the lift stage, while the rocket motor is as yet consuming, is a colossal benefit. Rather than catching a little atomic warhead, it's a lot simpler to hit a somewhat sluggish, hot promoter that is of enormous size. However, a test of skill and endurance makes it unreasonable. A regular ICBM consumes for around 250 seconds. As referenced before, it can require as long as 30 seconds just to recognize an ICBM by satellites. Also, it can then take up to 60 to 70 seconds to send off an interceptor rocket. What's more, that is without considering a choice time. This brings the complete response time to 100 seconds after the start of the ICBM leaving just 150 seconds to catch the rocket. Contingent upon the model, an interceptor makes some consumed memories of around 100 seconds. Satellite and other ground-based sensors can direct the rocket toward the ICBM before it can secure to the intensity mark and strike the ICBM's construction and not sail innocuously through the shaky fire. This would be known as hit to kill. While more established and less high-level frameworks would draw near to the objective, and use vicinity breaker to explode a hazardous warhead, the hit-to-kill interceptors depend on motor energy, that is, the interceptor's mass and speed, to straightforwardly stir things up around town head-on and annihilate it. What follows an effective strike is a shoot-look-shoot -shoot strategy which affirms whether the rocket has been annihilated prior to sending off another interceptor. This limits the quantity of interceptors expected to overcome approaching rockets. As you will find out soon, that is vital. On paper, it's moderately simple to obliterate an atomic rocket during its lift stage. By and by, notwithstanding, you have extreme reach versus time difficulties for catching during support stage. First test is that the order and control has brief period to choose whether to fire an interceptor. In the event that settling on the choice requires over a moment, while possibly not less, the interceptor won't reach the ICBM before its lift stage closes. To conquer this time challenge, utilizing a weapon that travels was proposed at the speed of light, a strong laser. The objective of the YAL-1 airborne laser framework was to destroy adversary ICBMs during their help stage, from a distance of 115 to 200 miles relying upon the sort of rocket. Be that as it may, the laser ended up being not viable since the air diffused the laser's energy more than it was initially expected. The powerful reach ended up being estimated in tens of kilometers which actually intended that the Boeing 747 on which the laser was mounted would need to be flying inside faux airspace. No boat Sherlock, the program was dropped. The subsequent test is range. 
the interceptors would need to be sent off from a somewhat close area to the ICBM's send-off site, which would make it defenseless against assault itself. Some say the lower bound is 30 miles, and the upper bound is 620 miles downrange. Notwithstanding, this is a major issue. It might work in the event of blocking a rocket sent off from North Korea, yet not whenever sent off from the center of Russia and China. While the American SM-3 rocket, which can be sent off from either naval force boats or Aegis shorewards, has the capacity to block ICBMs during support stage, it isn't considered to be a practical choice because of the reach time issue. The American rocket protection framework at present has no viable ability to obliterate ICBMs during the lift stage. There is, in any case, research being directed on new advancements with an emphasis on automated elevated vehicles. The lift stage might be out for the present, however obliterating an atomic rocket during its mid-course stage gives the biggest time span to do as such, which is around 20 minutes. Appears to be a great deal of time, yet achieving this undertaking may be more troublesome than hitting a slug with another shot. Long-range rocket goes at a speed of around 15,000 miles each hour. That is multiple times quicker than the speed of a typical projectile. There are two different ways Americans can block an atomic warhead during the mid-course stage. Utilizing a ground-based interceptor, or utilizing a standard rocket 3 Block 2 Alpha that can be sent off from Aegis cruisers and destroyers. The ground-based interceptor is important for a $40 billion bucks ground-based mid-course protection program, which is one layer of the American long-range rocket guard framework, planned to safeguard the U.S. from halfway and long-reach long-range rockets. A ground-based interceptor is a multi-stage, strong fuel sponsor with an exo-environmental kill vehicle or EKV. Exoclimatics signifies beyond environment, hence the EKV resembles a little rocket which depends on engines to move, since the blades can't assist with guiding outside the climate. This rather than endo-air, signifying inside air, where the vehicle is flexibility through streamlined powers. A promoter conveys the EKV toward the objective's anticipated area in space, and when it's delivered, it utilizes direction information communicated from ground backing and fire control framework parts, as well as ready sensors to shut in and obliterate the objective. Each ground-based interceptor requires its own storehouse, and every one of the 44 interceptors possessed by the U.S. are as of now situated at Vandenberg Flying Corps Base in California or Stronghold Griot, Gold Country. Every interceptor costs an incredible $75 million box. Beside the ground-based interceptors, one more method for obliterating a long-range rocket is to use the Aegis Long-Range Rocket Safeguard. In particular, the SM-3 Block II Alpha that can depend on satellites and different sensors to track and catch a transitional reach ICBM. This is known as Connect on Remote. The SM-3 is a multi-stage interceptor that can be sent off from VLS Mark 41 from cruisers what's more, destroyers as well as Aegis aground. The interceptor conveys a kill vehicle to space, where it moves to catch an approaching warhead. The greatest test for SM-3 interceptors is range. The send-off transport must be reasonably situated to catch an ICBM. For this reason SM-3s are just great at blocking middle-of-the-road range ICBMs, while ground-based interceptors can do both middle-of-the-road range and between mainland. Up to this point, things appear to be pretty much taken care of, until we present the following entanglement, imitations. During its mid-course stage, a normal Russian ICBM, similar to the R-36 Satan, can deliver what is by all accounts 50 atomic warheads. However, truly, just 10 of those are genuine warheads, otherwise called various freely targetable re-emergence vehicles or MIRV. The other 40 are baits. Out of nowhere, one ICMB has transformed into 50 different moving targets, 10 of which need to be captured. The safeguard frameworks need to have a method for segregating among distractions and deadly targets so valuable interceptors are not squandered on imitations. We ought to likewise add that other trash, similar to nose cones, can add to the segregation challenge. While low-goal radars can follow individual items, they can't separate between a deadly item versus a bait. 
To this end the US has the ocean-based X-band radar whose essential assignment is to separate deadly focuses from imitations, and afterward perform accuracy following of those warheads. One more comparable radar, the long-reach segregation radar at Clear Space Power Station in Focal the Frozen North, can likewise segregate deadly items from imitations, and forward their direction to interceptor rockets progressively. The LRDR development and establishments have been finished in an expensive $784 million box, with the last contacts presently being performed before the radar becomes functional in late 2022. The EKV, not just depends on its own sensors to segregate and perform target choice, it additionally utilizes information from the oppressive radars that we referenced knowing this. The number of ICBMs that how about the US sensibly block utilizing its whole load of 44 ground-based interceptors, just to show the intricacy of every ICBM having various warheads and baits consider this situation. A solitary R-36 ICBM can house 10 warheads and 40 fakes. Expecting that the separation radars can accurately distinguish every one of the 10 deadly warheads, you'd think the 44 ground-based interceptors can effectively kill something like 4 ICBMs conveying 10 warheads each. Yet, the response isn't your thought process. Each ground-based interceptor just has a 56% likelihood of really catching a solitary target. It would take not two, not three, however four interceptors to expand the likelihood of blocking a solitary objective to 97%, and that implies a solitary ICBM with 10 cent warheads can without much of a stretch overpower the US's whole ground-based interceptors and potentially explode on American soil. Also, to this end the American Rocket Guard framework depends on different layers. A solitary line would simply have the option to obliterate a negligible portion of approaching dangers, yet joining numerous lines of guard, last of which is the terminal stage, can obliterate most, if not all, warheads. A terminal stage starts when an atomic warhead re-enters the air. This stage is exceptionally short, just requires about a moment, and it's the last an open door to capture before the warhead arrives at its objective. All things considered, this is the most unhelpful time for interference since it can happen close to the planned objective, and there is additionally little edge for blunder. Note that when an atomic warhead is caught, it doesn't detonate. For a warhead to go basic, the dangerous charges need to go off in a particular succession, vital for start an atomic blast. The consequence of a capture would be a huge shower of radioactive materials close to the objective region, which isn't great. However, it's obviously superior to an atomic blast. The American Long Range Rocket Guard framework can catch warheads during the terminal stage utilizing the Terminal High Height Region Safeguard or a THAAD. The U.S. Naval Force SM-6 rockets sent off from warships, or with the U.S. Armed Forces Nationalist High Level Capacity 3 rockets. In any case, there's a trick. While review the Rocket Protection Office outline might give you the feeling that the guard frameworks that we just referenced can catch atomic long-range rockets, actually these interceptors can hit short-range, medium-reach, and middle-of-the-road range ballistic rockets. They can't kill intercontinental long-range rockets, since those warheads return the air at Mach 24+. Perhaps Thad would have the option to hit it head-on, yet I wouldn't wager my life on it in light of the fact that THAAD's maximum velocity is not as much as Mach 9, and is intended to capture rockets with speeds of Mach 5 to 8 at a most extreme elevation of 93 miles 150 kilometers. An elective method for destroying atomic warheads during their terminal stage is to utilize endoatmospheric interceptors outfitted with little atomic bombs. This is the very methodology that the Russian A-135 ballistic missile destroying rocket framework depends on. By detonating atomic interceptors on the line of the environment and space, the A-135 framework can debilitate approaching warheads going at paces of up to 15,600 miles per hour each hour or Mach 20. Who might have thought, killing nukes, with nukes? The reality is this, destroying something like an ICBM, while conceivable, is incredibly confounded. Also, we haven't even referenced flexibility re-emergence vehicles or hypersonic float vehicles that can outsmart protection frameworks. 
The ongoing objective of Rocket Guard Frameworks is to limit the danger of rebel countries like North Korea from sending off ICBMs towards American soil, as they are seen as not being discouraged. That is, they are not scared of all-out demolition, and could strike at any rate. A new 2022 review contended that no framework so far created has been demonstrated to be compelling against sensible ICBM dangers. Indeed, even from North Korea, the Pentagon individually conflicts. They feel certain about their capacities and guarantee that outside examinations depend on obsolete what's more, wrong information because of arrangement limitations. The Pentagon intends to foster a cutting-edge interceptor named Never Bomb Weapon Framework. I guess we'll see about that. On a hesitation, ideally, we won't ever have to find out.